All right, folks. Just a little note, uh, uh, notice, I may, actually I will not be here for the next couple of weeks and the classes, uh, Monday's class is going to be taken by Abuzer and uh, uh, UA on attention and graph neural networks. Then I have a, a family emergency, so I have to go home. And so uh, the uh, subsequent four classes will be online. As it happens, one of the, the TAs are going to be taking the second GAN lecture, so that will be in person, regardless of whether I'm here or not. And then hopefully by Thanksgiving, I will be back. All right. So, sorry about that. Let's, let's start. Here's where we were. We've been looking at sequence to sequence models. Uh, the first model that we saw was where uh, you had a sequence going in and an output sequence, but there was an order correspondence between the input and output. And then in the last class, we began looking at models where there was no notion of correspondence or synchrony or even correspondence or even a match between the input and output. For example, if you were doing machine translation, the word order at the input and the output might be different. The number of words might be different. If you had a dialogue system, what went in and what came out could be completely uh, you know, unrelated looking. How do we model such uh, uh, problems? And we figured that the way to model such problems is through the delayed sequence to sequence model, where the model looked at the entire input, interpreted it, and based on it, it generated language or generated output sequences that, that corresponded to the input. And so you had, this had two components. The first component processes the input to generate a hidden representation from it. This we call the encoder. And then the second component uses this hidden representation to generate an output. But then we saw that this naive structure had a problem. What was that problem? Anyone remember? Yeah, so, yes. Exactly, the outputs don't depend on each other, so we figured that what we really want to do is that uh, we want to have auto regression, meaning the output goes back into the input so that the specific output generated at each time actually considers the past outputs. And the reason for this is that the output is not deterministic. If the output were deterministic, then you wouldn't have to worry about this. But then there's an additional drawing process in that there's a, gen there's a probability distribution that's being computed by the network and you have a choice of which specific output to choose based on this probability distribution and different runs might result in different symbols being output, which is why that had to go back and see you. That was your question yesterday, right? So, uh, okay. So this was a simple, I call this a simple translation model because it's a very simple model. You guys could just implement it today and no big deal, right? It's not gonna take a lot of uh, coding on your part. So you had uh, the input sequence which feeds into a recurrent stru structure. The input is terminated by an explicit end of sequence marker. And then once you get an end of sequence marker, the corresponding hidden representation supposedly captures all the information about the input sequence and then the decoder the second recurrent neural network uses that final hidden activation as an initial state and a start of sentence marker as your initial symbol and then proceeds to generate outputs like so, right? And at each point, the decoder generates a probability distribution. You're drawing the word from that distribution and feeding it back into the network. You continue this until an end of sequence marker has been generated at the output. Now, that first term for the first portion of the network, which analyzed the input and uh, came up with the final hidden representation is what we call the encoder. The second one, which, uh, which used this thing to generate language or generate a sequence, output sequence, which matched, which corresponded to the input sequence was what we called the decoder. Now in all of this, when we were training this model, we observed this business of auto regression. What, what do I mean by auto regression? where an output feeds back into the input. So if the output Y goes back in at the next time step, it's regressing on itself. It's considering its own outputs to generate the next output. So it's auto regression. Auto is itself. Regression is computing, its, uh, computing the next output based on its own past outputs, right? So how did this affect our trainings? 
Anyone remember? See you? You remember? The training the model in general. There was an issue, right? This raised cost an issue. You had to fake training, right? You could not just run this entire model end to end and then compare the output to the target output because in the initial portion of the network, in the initial portion of training, there is no there's no guarantee that the output is going to be anything reasonable. Your target output may be 10 symbols long and this could generate 2,000 symbols. How are you going to compute losses? We saw that this was, this was not possible, so we faked it by saying that we're going to feed the target output back in instead of performing genuine autoregression during training. Everybody remember that, right? Good memory. So, and there was, again, there's one more problem, and there's a major problem with this framework. And the major problem is that every bit of input about information about the input sequence is being pushed into that little red box, the hidden representation at the end of the input. Now that would work if the input were five words, I, I ate an apple, four words, right? But suppose the input were, you know, a long paragraph of 200 words. Is that poor guy going to be able to capture all of that information? Not really, right? You're overloading this one poor thing. And moreover, what happens? As you go from the beginning to the end, as at each point, the representation is going to be overloaded in that the fifth hidden state is now storing information about not just itself, but the previous four words as well, right? And so it can't, it's going to lose focus about the more distant things. Even if you do it bidirectionally, it doesn't really matter everything is going to lose information about the distant things, right? So uh, you cannot, you can't really expect this one hidden representation to have information about things that happen far away. The fact is, every one of those hidden states carries information. And specifically, when I, for example, if I'm computing the hidden representation at N, what is the primary focus going to be on? Is it going to be on the current word and, or is it going to be on, on the past? So at each time, the hidden representation is going to focus primarily on interpreting the current input in the context of the past, right? So each of these hidden states is actually kind of representing more of the input at that time than the overall global picture. And so, if you look at the outputs, you would expect that this ish is going to be more related to the hidden state of the first input. That hover is going to be more related to, uh, where, what is it linked to, right? Eight, right? And so on. So there's going to be somewhat of a correspondence. Every output is going to have, is going to be more relevant to some portions of the input. Then, I mean, it's going to, so there are more referred to some portions of the input more than the others. And so, basically every output, the reality is every one of those hidden states carries information, and it carries very specific local information, and just trying to put, push everything into the final red state is kind of not very effective. So, how do we, map all of this? How do you account for the fact that every input has some information that could be relevant to the output? Here's a very simple solution. Instead of saying, I'm going to push everything into the final guy, I can just push my, I can just perform my recurrence and say I'm going to average everything. So when I average everything, at least I'm going to sort of not end up with a representation that only looks at, focuses on one point, right? I'm not going to be looking at a hidden representation that focuses on the end of sequence marker, for instance. So you're going to be capturing a little more about the local representation of every one of these guys. And now, and now, of course, when I average all of these guys, this one isn't directly equal to this anymore, right? The decoder has its own different initial state, which could be learned, which could be fixed. You know, there are different options. 
Anyway, the, this is still not enough, right? Why is this not enough? Well, do you agree that this is probably an improvement over having everything focused on this last guy, right? So, but then if it is an improvement, does it, is it, is it sufficient or are we still missing something? We are giving equal importance to all the inputs. Whereas when I'm looking at, when I'm trying to generate the word H, I should probably be focusing on the word I, right? So what does this mean? It means that it supplies this, because this means it supplies the same average to every output. In practice, different outputs may be related to different inputs. H to H is more related to I. Harbor and Gigasin are both, both are most related to eight and so on. And so what we really want is to use a different weighted sum of these hidden states for each output. It's making sense, right? So here I have five hidden states, and what I want to do is to compute some weighted sum of these guys for, to obtain what I will call now a context vector, and that context is going to be fed in to compute the first output then I'm going to average these guys with a different set of weights and use that new different combination to generate the second one and so on. So in this setting, the weights with which these hidden states are being combined, those are specific to the output word, the T, there's a subscript I, and there's a T in the parenthesis. The subscript I refers to the input the T in the parenthesis refers to the output, right? So I'm still computing a weighted sum of the hidden states for each of these guys, but the weights are going to be specific to the specific particular output being generated. And so in this case, here's how the uh, inference would happen. You just run the input through the encoder and you're gonna get a hidden sequence of hidden states. Then at the very first for the very first output word, the input of course is a startup sentence marker, but then you're going to have a second input which is being obtained from the encoder. And the second input is going to be some weighted sum of the hidden states for all the words in the input where the weights are very specific to the first word. Then, yeah. So then once the first word has been computed, that first word can go back in at the next time. Here it's ish. And then you're going to compute a different weighted sum of these hidden states. And the different weighted sum is going to form a new so-called context vector, which is also going to be input along with the word to the decoder at the second time step. And then once that's done, now you're gonna get your second word at the next time step, you're going to use a different set of weights to compute a completely different weighted combination of inputs. And this context is going to go in along with the second word to produce, generate a third, third output. And then at the fourth output, again, you're gonna have a completely different weighted set of these inputs. And that is going to go in along with the previous word to generate the output. And of course, the recurrent hidden state. Don't forget the recurrent hidden state, right? And, and so on until the end of sentence marker is generated. Now, if I want to do this, what is the desideratum over here? What do, I, what do I want the weights to do? What, must, what characteristics must the weights have? Anyone? Pardon me? Hmm? That's a good one, yes, what else? Yes, of course. But here's the other thing. The word ish, what does it relate to most? I. So how do you want the weights to be? You want the weights to focus automatically on the most relevant portions of the input, right? And if I'm generating ish, it has to kind of focus on I. If I'm generating harbor, it must sort of focus on eight. If I'm generating, you know, I and it must focus on and, right? and so on. So you want the, uh, the weights in generating any input output 
to focus on the most relevant portions of the input. And as you say, they must also sum up to one because you want to have a weighted sum, you don't want these contexts to be unbounded and blow up, right? They must be in the same range as the original hidden states themselves. And so this solution will work if the weight WKI, that should be WK parenthesis, this guy, guys make a note, the, the notation must be fixed, right? If the weights can somehow be made to focus on the appropriate input word. So for example, out here, when I'm computing the context vector, this orange context vector, I want the weight on the input side for Apple to be higher than the weights for the other guys. Somehow I need to be able to perform this, and if I have some mechanism that automatically gives me this weighting, then I expect the context to provide the right information so that the output generated can be appropriate, right? So the way these are what we will call the attention weights. The decoder is paying attention to the inputs when generating each output, and specifically these weights are attending to different portions of the input, and the expectation, these are dynamically computed as functions of the decoder state in the sense that at each time, you can't just arbitrarily choose, right? Specifically, what word you're going to output now also depends on what words you have output in the past. So they have, they, these are not fixed. You don't know how long the output is going to be. You don't know how long the input is going to be. So the weights themselves have to be computed on the fly based on the current setting of the, uh, the current state of the, of the decoder and also based on what the input, what the encoder contains, right? If I give it a different encoder, it's input sequence, then the weights would naturally expect to be different, right? So these must be dynamically computed, but then how are, they, how are they computed? Now, to compute this, I want the weights to be computable, meaning they have to be a functions of something. But what can they be functions of? They can be only be functions of the variables that I have available at that time. They cannot be functions of arbitrary things, right? And so now, if I'm computing, say, the appropriate context at time three, the encoder has already been processed, has al already processed the input, right? So the so we have all of these hidden states. And now if I'm trying to compute the appropriate context vector for time three, all the previous computation has been done. What is the information I have available with me now? Anyone? Yeah. The current hidden state and the current time. Go ahead. The current time. You have the time, what else? The current hidden state, you have S3, that is the latest thing that has been computed, right? You also have a choice of what the previous word was, but that, that is a, uh, uh, as that's kind of random, so maybe you don't want to consider this, or maybe you do, but then it's, you can define your own function, right? But here is the thing, that in order to compute the weight given to, say, Apple, you have to use all the information available when you get to this point, which is this guy, and maybe this guy, correct? Everything that you have available as you approach that box. In the example I'm using, I'm just showing you what was originally done. They only use the hidden state, but in reality, you could come up with your own function, right? Which uses all the available information. And so, using the hidden state actually gives us some nice clean formulation. So if I want to compute the weight for say H2 over here, to compute the weight for H2, it's going, the weight itself is going to be some function of H2 and S2. If I want to compute the weight for H0, that's going to be a function of H0 and S2, and so on, right? So, but then I have this additional requirement. Let's see, you just mentioned. I want the weights to be positive and sum to one. How do I impose that constraint? Do you have any, do you know of any mechanism which can take a bunch of numbers and somehow convert them into a dist probability distribution? a soft max, right? So here is what we will do. We want the weights to be positive and sum to one, and they must be high for the most relevant inputs for the ith output and low elsewhere, everywhere else, right? And so the way we do it is we will have a two-step weight computation. We're going to have some function g, which 
looks at the hidden state and the previous, the, the, the uh, hidden representation on the input, the encoder representation, and the previous hidden state of the output. And it's going to combine those two in some manner to compute a raw weight. And so you have in the first step, you're going to use this guy, S2, to compute a raw weight for every one of these terms. These raw weights could be anything. They could be negative, they could be positive, we don't care. But then the second step, we're going to use those and pass those through a softmax. And the softmax will convert these numbers to a probability distribution. And now you have a weight, a sequence of weights for the inputs. And that set of weights is specific to the output, right? Each output is gonna be computing a different set of weights. And now using those weights, you can combine the inputs to uh, get the context. Here's your first part. This is the first time we are understanding the why behind the tension is all you read paper. All right. Anyway, when they explain the word. Okay, I'm going to stop in five. Anybody on Zoom who wants to answer the first question? True. Second question, Lakshya, since you are so happy. <laughs> what? Is that true or false? Not an answer in Zoom. What does it say? False. Okay, now Lakshya, your turn to answer the third. Oh man, somebody else? <laughs> All right. So the attention framework computes a different context vector at each time. It's chosen as the hidden encoder representation that is assigned the highest attention weight. No, you're actually computing a weighted combination. In principle, really, you could be choosing the one that has the highest attention weight. And that might actually just work too, but I think it will be suboptimal, right? I'm not aware of anybody who has test tried that. And also, there may be multiple input words that are relevant to any specific output word, right? Uh, the attention weight to any input word is a function of the hidden encoder representation of the word and the most recent decoder state. So everybody with me so far? Questions from you guys at the back? Nope. Brilliantly clear, I'm so flattered, okay. Now, uh, so here's where we are. We, we, need, we uh, needed a function that could take the hidden state at the output at the previous output time and the input hidden states and compute this raw weight, right? What could this function possibly be? There are many options. So if these H's and these S's are all the same size, then they're the same length, then I can just compute it in a product. And so the simplest mechanism to do that is going to be said to, is to say that G of HI, ST minus one is HI, the inner product between HI and ST minus one. Now if the two are different lengths, then you have to take a matrix in a product to match the length up, right? And then you have this magical matrix WG, which can be a learned parameter. And then there are other more complex functions that have been specified. You can even have a complete MLP to take care of this thing, which will have its own set of learned parameters. You can make it arbitrarily complex, but simple is better. Simple is beautiful, Occam's razor, stay with the simple stuff. And then of course, that's only gonna give you the raw weights, you have to put them through the softmax. So the entire process of uh, you know, generating a an output given an input is going to look something like this. Let's consider, consider a typical conversion process assuming this, actually this model as an example. Or do I, I'll have to see one of those two linear ones, okay. You're going to pass the input through the encoder and that's going to give you one hidden state value for each input. 
And then subsequently, at the output, you're going to start off with an initial st hidden state, right? And the initial hidden state, what is this magical initial hidden state? It could just be zeros, you just chose this to be zeros, or this could be a bunch of ones, or it could be a learned parameter, or it could be derived through some matrix transformation of the average value of all of the input hidden states. There are different choices, uh, and there are pluses and minuses to these. It does, as far as I know, it doesn't make such a tremendous difference when the inputs are long enough. And then, uh, once you have that, this is going to be your initial hidden state, right? So then you can use this S minus one with all of these hidden state values to compute your raw, was there a question on Zoom? No, no. okay. So you can use this S minus one with all of these hidden states to compute the raw weights at each time. And then using those raw weights, you're going to pass them through a softmax and you're going to compute the actual weights at each time. And then you use those actual weights to combine the hidden representations on the encoder side. You get the context vector at the zeroth time. And that's fed in. It can, that context vector can be, in the decoder can be arbitrarily long. I'm actually showing you a very simple, uh, arbitrarily tall. I'm just showing you a very simple example over here. The whole point is that of using all available information to compute these attention weights to compute a output specific context which is being fed to the decoder, right? And then once that is done, the decoder is actually going to generate an output probability distribution. It's not gonna generate a, word, a vector directly. And from that distribution, you're going to sample the first output, right? You're gonna draw, draw it somehow. And then once you draw that, so you know, that could be the word ish, for instance, that's going to go in to the second time step. But then for the second time step, it's not enough to have ish. You're going to also get the recurrent state coming in, but then you need a context coming in from the encoder side. And so you would be using this hidden state as zero, along with these input representations, H zero through H four in this example, and computing your raw weights for all of the inputs. The raw weights are gonna be put through the softmax to compute an actual distribution of weights. And that distribution of weights is now going to be used to, uh, that, that set of weights is now going to be used to average these hidden representations to give you the context vector for the next output. And now that context vector goes in along with ish, and the output is going to be, once again, a probability distribution over words for the next word, from which you're going to draw the next word, right? And now at the next time step, that goes in, and now you have S1 as the latest available hidden representation, right? And so S1 is going to be used along with the encoder representations to generate all the raw weights, which are then normalized to get the actual attention weights, which are used to compute the second context vector which goes in. And you can continue this process, and then you draw a word from that. You continue this process until you actually generate an end of sequence marker, right? Is the process clear to everybody? Right, I've given this to you step by step. If you were implementing it, you'd be using, do, doing it using matrix math. And matrix math can be very opaque. So when you look at the equations, you have no clue what's going on. You mechanically write these things down. Because that's easy, right? Being mechanical is the easiest thing you can do in the world. So, uh, but this is really what is going on. Now, what about, so this is how the whole thing works, right? This is the attention-based decoding end to end. That's a complete process that I've shown you in one figure. But we don't actually do something as simple as this. Here, we, you can take this one step further. The hidden state representation is being used on the input is being used to both obtain, figure out what is you know, the relevance of that input to a specific output, and is also being used to compute the information, the context information that's being fed to the decoder, right? So now there is the possibility that the, that the information about what is relevant is not, is, is not identical to the information that must be passed to the context. And so the way we will normally do it is to 
derive two separate terms from these hidden representations. One we call a key, the other we call a value. The key is what is going to be used. The key is carrying information about what is relevant about this input to the decoding process, or to the what, what is relevant to the weights being computed by the decoding process. And the value is carrying information about what is it about this in, about the hidden representation that should go as context to the decoding process. And so this uh, key value is typically going to be some linear transformation of the hidden state. The value is going to be a diff, some other uh, linear transformation of the hidden state. On the decoder side, once again, the query, you, you derive something called a query from the state. The state itself is not everything that you want, right? The specific, the manner in which you derive a query can be arbitrarily complex. And so you derive something called a query from the hidden state, typically by through a linear transform. And so now this sort of frees up things. The value can have a completely different dimensionality than the key. The hidden state can have a completely different dimensionality than the query. So the dimensionality of the feature that is, that, that, is in, that, is, that is needed to compute the best weights will typically be lower or can be lower than the dimensionality of the feature that provides the context that goes forward, right? And this gives you the freedom to separate these two. And now <laughs> the actual computation of the raw weights for the inputs is based on the query and the key and then once the raw weights are computed, you actually compute a weighted sum of the values to provide the, to generate the context. And that's what goes into the decoding process. So this is just a, uh, the general mechanism. It may, you, you see how it makes sense. You, you're just sort of decomposing the process more and more to get finer information uh, for, before, for the decoder. But generally, I'm just going to not specifically talk about uh, having a separate key and value and query. I'll, just for the purpose of illustration, I'm just going to assume that we're just working directly off the hidden states, which means that the key and the value are both equal to the hidden state on the input. The query is equal to the you know, uh, decoder hidden state on the output, just for convenience, okay? Yes. You could directly, the, 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 this is sort of providing you with additional flexibility that the hidden state might carry information and not that, that not all of which is relevant to the decoder side. For example, if I'm encoding English, not everything about English is relevant to German. So, the, so computing a value from it is allowing you to distill what is relevant as opposed to everything that represents the input. That answer your question? Okay, so anyway, I'm just going to assume that we are not actually separating things. Now, this is fine. Now, what about the process of actually generating an output? What are we actually doing? Once again, remember this is a maximum a posteriori uh, decoding process, right? And so a maximum a posteriori decoding process is basically, what do I mean by maximum a posteriori decoding process? What, what am I actually trying to estimate? Anyone? Pardon me? No, what is the entire model trying to do? The model is trying to generate, the model actually computes O1 through On, where N is not known, given the input I1 through IK, correct? It's actually computing, this is supposed to be a model that computes the probability of any output sequence given an input sequence. And what we really want to do is to find the output sequence
that is most probable. F, right? Where the length n itself is also not known. This is what we are really trying to do. This is, all of these are probabilistic machines. They are giving you a posteriori probabilities for the classes. What is the probability of each class given the input? And you're always choosing the most likely class. That is the objective. Now, when you're doing standard, you know, whatever object recognition or classification of that kind, you have a very interesting and very convenient situation. The number of classes is finite, right? And because the number of classes is finite, I can simultaneously give you the probabilities for all of the classes. And then you can pick the most likely one, right? In this case, how many classes do we have? Pardon me? How many classes do we have? How many sentences are there in German? <laughs> infinite, right? So you're actually computing a probability distribution over infinite classes. You have an input, every possible, every sentence in, Ger in German is a candidate for that input. And there's a probability associated with every sentence in German. You want to compute these probabilities using the input and you want to pick the one that's most likely, correct? Is that making sense? Can you treat this like a standard classifier with one output for every class? You cannot. So what do we do over here? Instead of, this is the key piece for the, of what is happening over here. Instead of having one output for every possible class in your, for, in, in, your, in your symbol set, because the symbol set is infinitely large, we are going to compute the probability for one sequence. So this is, this is what changed for between your standard CNNs and your MLPs and these sequence to sequence models you can, it's actually computing the probabilities. So for example, if, I, if this is what was being given, right? At the very first time, what did I compute? At the very first time, I computed P of O1, given all the inputs, and the first one, end of uh, start of sentence marker, which is always a given, right? So we don't have to worry about this. But at the next time, when I was drawing the second word, harbor, what was the probability distribution I used? This was the probability, uh, this is at time zero, right, at, at time zero. At time one, the probability distribution was over all symbols, given the input and SOS, which we had, and ish. So this is not generic, right? At each time you're computing a probability distribution in a very specific manner. So of the world of all pro infinite probabilities, you're looking at a very, very, very narrow subset and picking things from it, right? And so this gives you a problem. Somehow you have to make this subset look at the right region of the input space so that when you pick something from it, that's the most likely one. Making sense? You see the challenge over here, right? And so if I look at it this way, at the first time, it's actually going to give you a probability distribution over, uh, or, so this is just a standard, you know, base decomposition, right? At the first time, it's going to give you the probability distribution over the first word. At the second time, it's going to give you the probability distribution over the second one given, given the first word and so on. So if you multiply all of these y's, the probabilities of all the words that you have chosen, that is the probability for the specific symbol sequence that you picked. And we have to find the symbol sequence for which this is maximum. Now, the problem here is that this means that a single pass through the model is computing the probabilities for only one sequence, not all infinite sequences, right? So this means that if I want to pick the most likely sequence, I really have to compute the model individually on all infinite sequences, right? And the way you can do it is to represent all infinite sequences as a tree. But we know that's not going to happen, right? This is going to blow up. And so we're going to do, what is our solution? Beam search. At the first instant, you're going to pick the k most likely words. 
you know, you compute the probabilities for all the words, pick the k most likely, and then repeat the process. Compute the probabilities over all the words, pick the k most likely. And the likelihood that you're gonna be computing is the product of the probabilities along the entire path. That is what you would be using to decide which the most k most likely terms are. Is exactly what we had in the previous class or when we were dealing with CTC models, right? And again, do you see the key distinction between the inference process over here and the inference for standard models? What is that? What is the key difference again? Space. So in your standard models, you're computing probabilities for every single class. Over here, you cannot. So here, you're computing probabilities for one class at a time. And somehow, you're looking through a peephole, and somehow you must learn to focus this peephole so that whatever you pick is the most likely class. And this peephole can be just one long if you're greedy. The peephole can be k wide if you're using a beam. Make sense? Right, okay. And so which is why uh, it's highly likely that you end up picking the wrong things. But it kind of works, so we, we are happy, right? And now, and then you continue until you get a sequence that ends with an end of sequence marker, which is the most likely sequence of all, okay? So now, the key component in all of this is the attention weight. The weight in order to generate any output must for, for at each output, you have an attention weight which looks at all of the inputs, right? What do these weights look like if you do this properly? So here's what it looks like when you train these models. This is an English to French translation scheme my problem that the authors of the original work uh, uh, presented this work on. And so at the top is the English that went in and each column represents the set of, actually, so, uh, each row represents the set of weights that was used to compute the corresponding output on the left, right? And so the first word, you can, you can see this, this is, where is my trident, okay. Uh, the agreement on the European economic area was signed in August 1992. The French is le, which corresponds to the, and you find that attention in fact did end up focusing on the, right? Agreement is accord. So there's a one-to-one. -one. Again, you find that attention ended up focusing on agreement when it was generating a chord. The third word is sur, which is on. So again, the attention weight was on the right place, right? But then this is then las the, so the attention weight is in the right place. But then the next one, in English, it's the European economic, the economic Euro, European economic area. But in French, the word order changes, right? <laughs> The French is zone economique européen. The word order is exactly flipped. And then if you look at the attention weights, when it's generating zone, it's actually automatically focusing on zone, on area. Based on the previous inputs, the model realized that the thing to focus on is the word area at this point. And by focusing on that, it was actually able to uh, produce the word zone. But then the next word was economic, and it realized based on everything that's been seen so far that the word to look at is economic. And so the attention weight focuses on economic. And then the next word is European, which uh, uh, focuses just magically on the word European, although the word order is different, right? And the model has figured these out. And so if you actually look at these attention weights, it's diagonal most of the way, but where the word order changed, the, the attention's actually sort of focused appropriately on the right things, right? But it's not enough to focus on just one thing. The fact that it's European also has uh, there's some, uh, the, uh, also depends on some of the adjacent words, and so you have a few other terms nearby, which are also mildly highlighted, but you see how the whole thing kind of works, right? The rest of, the, rest of them are examples of the same kind of thing. Uh, this will change my future with my family. I don't know enough French to actually make out that. These are tension that are right, but trust me, they're right, right? It makes sense. I'm not even gonna pretend. Here are some examples of English to French translation. I'm not gonna pretend I understand any of this, but in the past I've had students, anyone in class who knows French? Kind of, are these, are these translations reasonable? They're reasonable? Okay, Peter thinks they're reasonable, so we will, he has decreed. They are reasonable, okay. <laughs> Take a bow. <laughs> so, uh, so, 
we have seen how a train network can be used to compute outputs, convert one sequence to the other, right? This is given training. That's what the beam search was all about. But what about training itself? For training itself, things get a little tricky. You're going to be just given an input, I ate an apple, and the output is, you know, Shaba and an apple gagasin, right? But then uh, we have the same problem as before. That if I treat the entire model as a box where inputs go in and outputs come out, then during the, inter the, in the initial stages of the process, there's no guarantee that the output is going to have any kind of correspondence to the input. So you cannot really compute a loss, which means that this whole thing becomes impossible to handle, right? So to deal with that, we're going to make a small change. As, and what will that change be? We fake it. I'm actually going to pass the output back in. Instead of performing genuine auto regression, what I will do is I will actually take the, I'll, I'm not going to draw a sample and pass it back in. I'm going to pass in the actual words. So the words that I'm passing in are a shaba and an apple over here. Whereas if I were doing this the proper way, I'd have been drawing a word from the output distribution using whatever process, passing it back in, then drawing a word from the output distribution and the next time passing it back in and so on. So this is faking it, right? But now I can actually compute the KL divergence and then I can use that using your Autodef or the more complicated math if you're masochistic uh, to compute derivatives and uh, perform gradient descent. Making sense? Yeah. All right, so, and if you have a complex function for generating these attention weights, back propagation is also gonna uh, update its param the parameters. Now, this is completely faking it, right? This, you're, che you're cheating really, really hard. Now, suppose you have a small bit of a conscience, what would you do? You know, you have 10, 10 problems in your, in your uh, assignment, you cheated on t all 10, you feel bad. So you say, okay, I'm only gonna cheat on nine. On the 10th, I'm going to give, I'm going to try on my own, right? And that's basically what you do over here. So this is what is called teacher forcing. You take a gun to the teacher and ask, stick it to their head and ask for the answer. And that's teacher forcing out here, right? You force the teacher to give you the correct answers. But then your conscience kicks in and say, okay, for the third word, I'm not, I'm, here I will stick my, keep my gun in my pocket and I'll actually go through the process of drawing a word. And now I draw that word in and that's what is actually going to go in. So this is a little bit less of cheating, but then hopefully this teaches the model to be a little more you know, robust to, uh, you know, because if you, when you cheat too much, maybe eventually the model learns not, doesn't learn to work when it's not, doesn't have a teacher in the room with a gun to her head, right? So uh, you sort of uh, like to ease up and the fraction of the time that you will, you will ease up would typically sort of increase as you train your models, right? Yeah. Thank you. Right, so sampling is not differentiable, right? Because when I sample something from a distribution, putting it in, the process of sampling is not differentiable. So if, you, if there's an output going in over here, Ideally, you're going to have to have a gradient go back through this process, but sampling is a nasty thing. You can't differentiate it. So this is where we use the so-called gumball noise trick. It turns out that randomly drawing a sample from a multinomial, from a category distribution is the same as adding this prob the probabilities, the log probabilities to uh, a uh, uh, drawing, Log, log probabilities to random samples drawn from something called a gumball distribution, and then picking the max. So you converted the problem of picking a random sample to the problem of picking a max by, because of the equivalence between drawing a random sample from a distribution and picking the max from a collection of gumball samples drawn from a gumball distribution to which the log probabilities have been added. But the nice thing about picking a max versus picking a random sample is that max is deterministic, right? And I can convert the problem of picking a max as, as, a, as a soft max. And so now I can compute a soft max over G plus, uh, G plus log Y. And this soft max can actually end up, remember the inputs are all one hot, right? 
So I can, instead I could just use the softmax that goes in as my one hot and uh, uh, that simulates sampling. And now because it's a softmax, we can differentiate through it and you can perform the entire back propagation. Anyway, so that's sort of, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to move on, but any questions? What was I in that previous slide? Which one? Uh, what is GF, GFI is a random sample drawn. So suppose I have a vocabulary of n sample, n words. I'm going to draw n samples from a Gaussian, from a, from a Gumbel distribution. For each of those n samples, I'm going to add the corresponding log probability of the output. So what is your output? Is it the i? So the I, our output ideally is going to be, you would pick the max, and that's going to be the i, correct? Okay. But then you're going to convert the i to a one hot representation. Okay. Instead, you could directly use the soft max probabilities, which focuses on the specific term that you would have drawn. Right? Okay. If you pick a one hot, input at a, inputs are not one hot, right? Inputs are word embeddings. One hot converted to word embeddings, right? There's a, there's a projection. Yes. So what do you do with the softmax that comes up? Do we pick the word and move it towards one embedding? The softmax here, remember, what is a word embedding? That's a projection applied to the one hot. You can apply a projection to a softmax, right? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so there are various extensions. If I'm separating the encoder from the decoder, the encoder can be bidirectional. At this point, you get a better representation. Uh, you have things like local versus global attention. There's a lot of work on the subject, but the basic concept is what we've just gone through. And uh, then there's, there's extensions. Uh, we just assume that I'm going to compute one context vector with its own attention, but then it may turn out that for different aspects of the output, I have to focus at different regions of the input. So in order to do this, you might want to compute multiple contexts where each context uses a different set of weights. If that is the case, how would you do this? From each input, you'd compute multiple sets of keys and values. Use each, each of which would use its own linear transforms, right? And from on the output side, you're going to compute multiple sets of queries. And so the kth query on the output side is going to be used with the kth set of keys on the input side and the corresponding attention weights are going to be used with the kth set of values to compute the kth context. You're going to get as many such context vectors as the sets of keys and values that you've computed, each of which is called a head, attention head, and then you can concatenate these, these attention, uh, these context vectors to there to form the extended context vector. So this is what is called multi-head attention, right? Each attender focuses on a different aspect of the input. That's important for the decode. So here's my questions, anyone? Ten seconds, guys. Okay, someone on Zoom want to answer the first question? Full tree, A. Okay. The first question, which do you think is the correct answer? The full tree, okay. Uh, all right, so Taeyong, can you answer the second question? Second and third, right? So uh, only a full tree search is going to give you the optimal decode. Beam search is like looking through a keyhole, right? And uh, uh, in a, the uh, key and value are not used to compute attention weights. What are the terms compute used to compute the attention weights? key and the query, right? And multi-head attention computes separate sets of keys and values and queries for each, for each attention head. And training with teacher forcing, does that compute the theoretically correct loss? 
No, because you're cheating. You got a gun to the poor teacher's head. You never learned your lessons. Now, but this has had some you know, really impressive results. They're currently responsible for the state of the art in many sequence conversion systems like machine translation, uh, dialogue systems, speech recognition, you're going to do that in homework four, and so on. And even in things like image captioning. So here, for example, the input doesn't have to be text anymore, right? The input can be anything. And so here they've actually used attention to generate captions for images. And so here are the uh, images that, for this image, this was the caption generated. And if you find out what the attention was when it generated the word Frisbee, you see that it actually sort of highlights the region of the image corresponding to the Frisbee, right? Or over here, uh, a giraffe standing in a forest with trees in the background. When you look for what is it that it pays attention to when it says trees, it's paying attention to everything except the giraffe. So it's very impressive, right? The whole thing really works. So you know, as a quick recap, we've looked at various forms of sequence to sequence models and generalizations, which are generalizations of recurrent network formalisms. Uh, lots of papers, post on Piazza if you have questions, it's going to appear in homework four. If you haven't understood this lecture, then you are going to encounter the contents in homework four anyway. If you go through homework four mechanically without understanding the homework, good for you. Anyway, uh, but then here is the thing, let's move on. The input sequence feeds to a recurrent structure, which is, uh, you know, the, in the simple translation model, this is what we had, the input sequence feeds to a recurrent structure, which generates a hidden representation, which is then used later, right? For the attention model, again, you had a recurrent structure, which uh, converted computed hidden representations. And then the output, uh, for each output, we automatically figured how, which inputs to pay attention to in order to compute the context, right? What was the point of having a separate weight for each input? Why did we do that? I mean, why, do we, why did we need these attention weights? Why didn't we perform just uniform averaging? Someone mumbled something, so say it aloud, Anusha. So you want to have different importance for each of the inputs, right? So that means you're sort of assuming that the, uh, when I'm generating ish, I should really be focusing on, a, on whatever representation came out of I, right? When I'm generating apple, I should be focusing on whatever representation came out of apple. But is the representation that's coming out just representing apple over here? Not really, right? It's a recurrent model. At Apple, I'm actually already figuring in everything in the past, right? So do I really need this recurrence? If I got rid of the recurrence, don't you expect that I'd be focusing more on Apple and less on everything that happened, right? So you don't expect things to be vastly different if you simply got rid of these guys, right? That making sense? You're looking lost. Okay. So if it captures the context, how does it, how, where is the ca context captured? How is the context captured? It's a very nice point. Correct. So what is the effect? So just over here, in terms of if I do this versus this, what would the effect be? <coughs> so basically when I have the recurrence over here, what is happening is the, I, I'm still computing representations for each word, but the represent, I'm getting a word specific representation H, but the word specific representation is not just word specific, it's also co in input context specific, right? So I want to say if I, the same word read could be a noun or a verb, depending on whether it's a, it's a uh, you know, or read, some other word. The words can be, that can be both nouns or verbs, right? Now, depending on whether it's a noun or a verb, I want to generate a different, different representation. 
if I get rid of the context, you're right, I may not get, I may, I may not capture this information. In the translation process, this is going to be a problem. Nonetheless, it makes sense that maybe recurrence is not really all of it, right? So this eliminates context specificity in the encoder embeddings. And the uh, embedding for the word and, for instance, must read or read. Uh, is it present tense? Is it past tense? Is it noun? Is it verb, right? Uh, so this must depend on the remaining words. And so how do we introduce con context specificity? I'm going to use the attention framework itself to generate context specificity. And the way I will do it, I will do for something called self-attention, right? So for F, this is what we would do. For, for every word in the input, I'm going to use some mechanism, like maybe a simple MLP, to generate a local representation for the word, okay? And then from every word in the input, I'm going to compute three values, a query, a key, and a, uh, and a, uh, a value, right? Remember, when earlier on the input side, you were computing keys and values, on the output side, you were computing queries, right? Here, I'm going to be generating queries, keys, and values for every one of the inputs. And then, and these, and so these guys are, generated using three separate linear transforms. And then to generate the updated output for, uh, for say the first input, the updated representation for the first input, what happened to my chalks? I'm going to use the query for that word. So you know, these are my inputs. I'm speaking only of the inputs over here. I'm not even talking about the outputs, okay? So I have I1, I2, I3, I4, I5. And then for the first input I1, I'm going to compute a set of attention weights where I will use the query Q1 with the key is over here. This making sense, right? And so now that is going to give me a set of attention weights. Using those attention weights, now I can average the values. And the average value is going to give me an updated representation for the first word, right? Then for the second word, I'm going to use the query Q2 over here with all of these keys, and I will generate all of these attention weights. And these attention weights are going to be used with all of the values that I've got to generate the updated representation for the second word, and so on. Everyone with me so far, right? And so I'm going to use the key for the first word, zeroth. Uh, the index is different on the board than, and on the slides, but I'm going to use the, the query for the zeroth word with the keys for all the words, including the zeroth word, right? because clearly most of the information must come from itself, right? To compute the weights for all of the guys, I'm going to use those weights and I'm going to average the values with these weights to get the updated representation for the zeroth word. And I do the same for uh, every one of those words. So then I do the same thing for the next word and the next word and the next word and the next word. And now I have updated representations for all the words. So what has happened over here? In order to generate, I generated a first representation for the word, but then I, in order to, I updated it by looking at everything else. And in the process, I'm getting some information about the context. So now when I'm looking at trying to generate an embedding for the word read, whether it's going to be, uh, you know, R-E-A-D, whether it's read or read, it depends on what else happens in the, on the side. So it's, you're going to be looking at the things on the side to update the representation, right? And so you're going to get this so-called uh, self-attention, self-attended outputs for each word using the query for that word. You compute attention weights for all the words using their keys, and then compute attend updated representations for the words as attention-weighted sums of the values for all of the words. Yeah. Or 
So uh, a word to vec is generating a fixed representation for a word. This is very specific to the input, right? If I give you a specific sentence, there are only a small number of words in the sentence. So the embedding is gonna be very sentence specific. Yes and no, right? Let's get back to that. Let's see why. It's not a context window, right? If you're looking at infinite language and if you're looking at this word in, in every possible context, again, over there, when you're doing a word to vec, the representation that you get for a word is going to be the same regardless of which context you get, you're capturing it in. So you're ca capturing an average representation across all contexts. Right here, if the, the same word occurs twice, you can end up with two different representations within the sentence, right? Depending on the context, yes. Are they we will get to that, right? So both of you have very valid points and I'll get to that, right? So this is first, this is what we call a single head self attention block, but then I can have many copies of these. And so I'm gonna have a multi head self, each of which is each of which is a different head, which is going to have its own set of, uh, each of which is gonna have its own set of weights, uh, uh, matrices, linear transforms to compute keys, queries, and values. And so each of them is going to generate one representation, one updated representation for the word. You concatenate all of them to compute, compute the the extended representation, okay? So this is what we call multi-head self-attention. And so this multi-head self-attention is now, as you can think of this block, which takes as an, takes an input and generates an updated representation. And typically, in the way this thing is designed, that is put, you know, mangled further through a, some additional processing like a multi-layer perceptron, which operates individually on each of these outputs to generate the updated representation, right? And so this whole thing is what they will call a multi-head self-attention block, okay? Uh, now, so this whole thing, I can just draw it as this, the multi-head self-attention block, which is basically this figure over here, okay? And now on the encoder side, I still haven't answered CU's question, or what is your name? Thank you. Jun Hyun. Is that, is that a good pronunciation? Yes. Perfect, so Junior, right? Uh, so these guys brought up a very important problem, right? And Junior's point is particularly relevant, so let me get to that. Uh, so this the encoder can actually have many such blocks, right? And that's going to be uh, a, that's going to completely replace recurrence. Now the reason you want to do this is that when you have recurrence, you have sequential processing, right? Whereas here, this guy, and recurrence also has this issue that the proximity is distance dependent, right? You may be trying to make things more, less distance dependent by using LSTM-like structures, but there's always some distance dependent. Whereas attention is going to be purely value dependent, right? So uh, uh, this sort of, that's one. The second is that you can process the, each of the you can compute the, the updated values for each of the words independently of the others, so you can parallel process, which makes the whole thing much more efficient. <laughs> but yes? You have, you're given the sentence. But uh, every sentence can have different lengths. Yes, yes it does. Like length and like Those are engineering uh, tricks you will have to employ, okay? So, the encoder is, a is in a sequence to sequence model can replace recurrence through a series of multi-head self-attention blocks. But then, this gets to Junior's question, right? question, right? If I have the same word occurring multiple times in a sentence, are the representations going to be different? Yes or no? Not in this format, right? Because position is not being considered. And he's right, if I eventually gave you a sentence which was infinitely long, which represented all possible language, I'm just basically going to end up with, what? We just said it, the word embedding, right? Something that looks like the generic word embedding. So 
you have to worry about position and the relative distance to different things, right? And which sort of ensures that if I have multiple copies of the same word in a sentence, I get a different representation depending on the specific context that you must interpret that word in. And for that, we're going to use something called, firstly, positional embeddings. And typically, we're not going to start off with, with uh, words themselves. We're going to use word embeddings going in, number one. And number two, now, what we will do is to add something that captures position to each one of these embeddings. Something called a positional embedding, which captures the relative distance of the words from one another. Now you need positionals, you need to capture information about position. So one way to capture information about position is to just say, I'm going to add this, this position dependent vector, which is unique at each position. And that way, once I add it in, every word is going to have a different representation, right? But just adding, but that I could have generated the position dependent vector randomly. That's not very useful, right? It's losing notion, of, firstly, it's losing notion about the distance between terms, you're losing notions about similarity, so you don't want to just make an arbitrary position dependent vector, you want some structure to it. And the specific structure you want is that you want a sequence of position dependent vectors that you're going to add. This position dependent vector is just a vector which represents the current position that you're just adding to the embedding, right? But these you want to have a specific, you want a specific characteristic for them. And the specific characteristic for them is that if I look at two position vectors, I should be able to tell you how far apart they are. That way the position vectors automatically capture relative positions between words. And so the way we will do it is we're gonna design position vectors which have this form. If I look at the t plus tau position vector and the tth position vector, the relationship between them, I want, they want it to be of the form p of t plus tau equals m of tau times p of t. So this matrix m depends only on the gap, the distance between the vectors, right? If I have my position vectors have this format, then my position vectors are going to actually not only uniquely represent position, but also carry information about the relative arrangements, distances between different positions. So what kind of position vector will actually have this structure? You can have different, different uh, forms, but uh, this is the one that, that was originally proposed, which is actually quite popular, is this one, which is just a vector of sines and cosines. So you have the sine of, at, it's varying with time, right? Each of them is a sinusoid or a cosine. You have pi, pi by two off. And, and the first two terms have the frequency the omega one, the second two terms have the frequency omega two and so on, where the lth frequency is one over some large number, 10,000 raised to uh, two L over D. Now this position, position vector has, some, has an interesting structure because these are periodic sines and cosines. It's a bit like a, Fourier decomposition. It's going to be unique. It's never ever going to repeat. That much I guarantee you because uh, these, if I look at cos of t, cos of t never repeats. Cos of pi times t repeats, but cos of t without the pi never repeats, right? So as a result, this position vector is always going to be unique. But then secondly, if you act actually look at the position of vector of t plus tau versus the position vector at t, this is going to be related by this relationship where the transformation between the two is a matrix, who, a block diagonal matrix whose block diagonal entries are of the form shown on the board. This is standard trigonometric, uh, trigonometric, uh, relationship because sine omega of t plus tau equals sine omega t times cos omega tau plus whatever, right? So it's a standard trigonometric relationship. And so now this position vectors, if you plot them out, that's what the position vectors look like, the figure on the board. And those get added in over here. And now once you've actually sort of made these initial representations position dependent, you expect subsequently that all of the representations are going to not only be dependent on the word, but also on the position. 
and those can be passed on to the decoder, right? But then, this is your self-attending encoder, right? I can use the same trick on the decoder side. The way we defined the decoder, the decoder was also self-referential. It had recurrence, right? But we don't need it. But if I, if I want to remove recurrence, here's a small problem. In the encoder, when I was trying to generate, see, say, the updated representation at time t, I was computing, as a, as a, computing it as a weighted sum of all of the inputs, right? On the decoder, it's strictly sequential, left to right, because you need all the previous words to generate the next word. So if I want to do it in a blind, you know, using, use the same kind of mechanism, it's like saying that when I'm generating the tth rep updated representation for the tth word, I do not have the guys in future. I, ha I must block them out, I must mask them out. So they have this term of masked uh, attention. The term masked attention, there's nothing magical about it, it's just one-sided. You're always looking at only things behind you and never looking at things in front of you. That's all it is. But then the rest of the structure is still the same, right? The mass self-attention block, you again, has this masked, multi-head mass self-attention, the MLP, all the rest of it to give you the uh, decoded, uh, the updated re representation. The attention block, again, can have multiple uh, heads, and so you'd have a masked multi-head self-attention. And now, the decoder side, too, is going to have the same kind of structure without explicit ref recurrence. You're just going to be looking at this self-attended uh, re-evaluation of these, of these hidden representations. And once again, you need to have information about the position, so you're gonna to have to include a positional encoding. And, and uh, of course, this final representation coming out of the encoder must eventually go in for the decoding, go into the decoding, right? So uh, uh, the figure actually sort of also shows recurrence in the upper, uppermost layer. You may or may not have recurrence at any point. This, these are interchangeable. So, but the point is, the entire thing can be done without recurrence. The only difference between the encoder and the decoder is that the decoder is a left to right process because you have autoregression. And so you have to compute each column independently and each column is computed using everything to the past, everything to the left using masked self-attention. So here's your I'm going to go like two minutes over, but you guys, I'm sure you guys will bear with me. The class is so exciting, right? He, he agreed enthusiastically with me and then fell asleep, okay. 10 seconds, guys. <laughs> Okay, so does someone on uh, Zoom want to tell me if the first statement is right? Yes. yes. Lakshay, you flunked your first two answers. The second statement, right? Can be, I'm wondering. Okay, does anybody think the second statement is right or is it wrong? Anyone? Why are you in doubt? Right, what about the third statement? Fourth, wrong. So self-attention needs an N cross N attention matrix and mass self-attention has to be at every layer of the decoder. Why? Because you need, because you have auto regression. The word has to be generated and gone, gone back in. So the processing must be sequential, right? Left to right. And you can of course combine recurrent layers with self-attention layers as I have in this figure. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. And the positional encodings in the encoder and decoder are not very different. The only difference between the encoder and the decoder is the masked attention, okay? So this is the so-called transformer architecture. You'll hear a lot more about it in Abu's lecture. It has the encoder, which is all attention, the decoder, which is all attention. And they call this paper, the paper called this attention is all you need which was 
uh, a landmark paper, which basically changed the way we dealt with sequences. And they actually show how these, their uh, model outperforms all kinds of the greatest, more, you know, the most state of art uh, systems at the time. It's more accurate because you end up requiring fewer parameters and it's much faster because the whole thing can be done in parallel because uh, you don't need the sequential left to right structure at least on the encoder side because of the, because uh, the thing can be parallelized. And now there were extensions. If I just look at the encoder, I can think of the encoder as a way of learning representations from off language, right? And so the encoder side was what the, was the famed GPT. Uh, the, wait, this one. The encoder side was the famed BERT. How have I lost it? Yeah, this was BERT, right? And the decoder side, which only looks at the right-hand side, this is an autoregressive thing. So you can think of this as a language model, right? And so all the language generation tools that you've seen on the web, which generate entire stories, are basically just the decoder of the transformer. And uh, you've seen, we might have seen various papers where they do everything from sentiment analysis to question answering and so on. There they actually use the encoder side, which generates representations for language, which is BERT. And so this attention is all you need. Paper says self-attention can effectively replace recurrence in sequence to sequence models. It requires positional encoding to capture positional information. And can be used, in fact, in pretty much any setting that has recurrence as a substitute for recurrence. It's been a, this was a remarkable uh, invention and it's currently the state of the art in most sequence prediction models. And as it turns out, even in computer vision models, right? So your final poll and we'll stop here. Abu will pick us pick up in the next class. No, the number of questions. <laughs> All right, guys, answer the poll and you may go. So if you take a lot of time, you're going to be here longer. I'm not giving you time. They will be here, the TAs will be here. On, my, on Monday, the class is going to be here. My class is Wednesday, the next Monday, the Monday after that, the Wednesday after that, and then the Monday after that, those four are going to be on Zoom. And then that, that Wednesday's class is going to be in class by the TAs again, and then I should be here the next week. Yeah, yeah Friday's registration is also in person. Thank you, everybody. Uh,